Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Chapter 26 About noon the next day, the boys arrived at the dead tree. They came to their tools. Tom was impatient to go to the haunted house. Huck was medically so also. But Sully said, Look here, Tom. You do, do you know what day it is? Tom merely ran over the days a week, then quickly lifted his eyes with a startled look in them. My, I never once thought of that. Huck, well, I didn't neither. But all I, I, at once it popped into me. It was Friday. Blame it on the body. Can't be too careful. Huck, you might have got an awful scrape tackling such a thing on a Friday. My better say we would. There's some say lucky days. Well, maybe, but Friday ain't. Any fool knows that. I don't reckon you was the first I found out. Yeah, Huck. Well, never did I say I was, did I? And Friday ain't all that either. I had bad and ran bad dreams last night. Dreamt about rats. No, saw a sign of trouble. Did they fight? No. Well, that's good, Huck. When they don't fight, it's only a sign there's trouble around. You know, we all we got to do is look mighty sharp and give out for it. I drop this thing for a day and play. Do you know Robin Hood, Hood Huck? No? Who's Robin Hood? Why, he's one of the greatest men that was ever in England. The best? He was a robber. Cranky. I wish I was. Well, who did he rob? I mean, sheriffs and bitches and rich kings and... People and kings and like, such like. He, ne- he never did bother the poor. He loved them. He was divided up with them perfectly square. Well, well he must have been a brick. I bet you he, he was, Huck. Oh, he's the uh, noblest man that ever was. There ain't, some, uh, ain't any man such man now. I can tell you, he could lick any man in him with one hand tied behind his back. He did Take his U-bow and plug a ten pence, ten piece every time, a mile and a half. What's a U-bow? I don't know. Some kind of bow, of course. If you hit the dime, only an edge, he would sit down and cry and curse. But we'll play Robin Hood. It's nobly fun. I'll learn you. I agree. Agreed. So he played Robin Hood all the afternoon. Now, then casting a yearning eye down upon the haunted house, a passing remark about the morrow's prospects was really there. The sun began to sink. In the west they took their home way homeward, a fault, a fault, the long shadows of the trees, and soon a buried for the sight in the forest across the curly field. On Saturday, shortly after noon, the boys were at the dead tree again. They had a smoke and a chat in the shade. I dug a little in the last hole, not with great hope, but merely because Tom said there were so many cases where people had given up a treasure after going, getting down within six inches of it. Then somebody else had come along and turned it up with a single thrust of a spurt shovel. The thing fell this time, however, so the boys shouldered the tools and went away feeling they had not trifled with fortune, but had fulfilled all the requirements that belonged to the business of treasure hunting. When they reached the haunted house, there was something so weird and ghastly about the dead silence. They rained there upon the baking sun, something so depressing about the loneliness, the desolation of the place. They were afraid for a moment to venture in. They crept in to the door and kept, took a trembling peep. He saw a green-grown flawless room, unplastered an ancient fireplace, vacant windows, a ruinous staircase, and there, there, everywhere, hung ragged and abandoned the cobwebs. He presently entered sharply, and quick and pulses talking in whispers, ears alert to catch the slightest sound, muscles tense and ready for instant retreat. Little while in formality modified their fears, they gave the place a critical, interested examination, rather admiring their own boldness and wondering at it too. Next, they wanted to look up stairs. It was something like cutting off retreat, but they got to the daring each other. Of course, there could be no but one result. They threw their tools into the corner and made their ascent. 
Up there were the same sides of the cave. My own corner, I found a closet with a forest mystery. The promise was a fraud. There was nothing in it. A carriage is up now, a well in hand. They're about to go down and begin work when... Shh, said Tom. What is it? whispered Huck, bouncing with a fright. Shh, there, hear it? Yes. Oh, my, let's run. Still, keep still. Don't you budge? They're coming right towards the door. Boys stretched themselves upon the floor. Their eyes to no, no holes in the thinking. Lay waiting in a misery of fear. They stop. No, coming. Here they are. Don't whisper another word, Huck. My goodness, I wish I was out of this. Two men entered. Each boy was said to himself, There's the old death and stone Spaniard. Been about town once a wise lady. Never saw the other men before. The uh, other was a ragged, uncut creature with nothing very pleasant in his face. The Spaniard was wrapped in set apart. He had a bushy white well whispers. Long hair white hair flowed from under his sabarino. He wore green goggles. Then when they came in together, they took in low voice. They sat down round facing the door with their backs to the wall. The speaker continued his marks. His manner became less guarded, and his words were to sink as he proceeded. No, he said. He I would it was all over. I don't like it. It's dangerous. Danger Dangerous? Grunted the deaf and dumb Spaniard, to the vast surprise of the boys. Mixed up. This voice made the boys gasp and quake. His Indian Joe's a silence for some time. Then Joe said, well, What's any more dangerous? A job up yonder. But nothing come of it. Why, there's different. Away from up the river, so not another house about. Won't well, never be known that we tied. Anyway, long as we didn't, we didn't succeed. Well, that's what's more dangerous than coming here in the daytime. Anybody would suspect us. Anybody would suspect us that saw us. I know that, but there ain't any other place as handy. I was that full of a job. I want to quit this shanty. I wanted it to yesterday. Only I wasn't any use to trying to stir out of here. Here, those infernal boys playing over there on the hill right in the field food. Those infernal boys quaked under the, under the inspiration of this remark. I thought how lucky it was they reminded remembered it was Friday, included to wait a day. They wished in their hearts they waited a year. Two men got out some food and made a luncheon. Off a long thought for silence. Indian Joe said, Look here, lad, lad, you go back up the river where you belong. Wait there till you hear from me. I'll take the chances on dropping into this town just once more. But look, we'll do that dangerous job off our spider around a little and think things will look well for it. Then for Texas, we'll leg it together. It's a satisfactory. Both men presently fell to yawning. Indian Joe said, I'm dead for sleep. It's your turn to watch. He curled down in the weeds and soon began to snore. His comrades stirred him once or twice. He became quiet. Presently the watcher began to nod. His head drooped lower and lower. Both men began to snore now. The boy drew a long, grateful breath. Tom whispered, Now's our chance come. Huck said, I can't. I'd die if they was awake to wake. Tom urged. Huck held back. At last, Tom rose slowly and softly and started alone. But the first step he made rang such a hideous creak on the crazy floor, he sank back again, almost dead with fright. He never made a second attempt. Boys lay there counting the dragging moments till it seemed to them a time must be done, eternity growing grey. But they were grateful to note that, that at last the sun was settling. Now one snore ceased. Indian Joe set up, stared around, smiled grimly upon his comrade. Well, yeah, whose head was drooping upon his knees, turned up with his foot and said, Here, you what? You're watchman, ain't you? All right, though. No, nothing happened. My, have I been asleep? Oh, partly, partly. Nearly time for us to be moving that bad. You know, we're, well, all we didn't do with that little swag we got left. I don't know. Leave it in here where we're always done. Like we've always done, I reckon. No use to take it away with all 
to his wench start south, 650 in silver, something to carry. Well, all right, your manner to come here once more. No, but I say, come in the night, as you used to do. It's better. Yes, but look here. It could be good, good, and well, before I get the right chance at a job, that, that job in accidents might happen. Ain't sure it's a good, very good place. We just regularly bury it, and bury it deep. Good idea, said the comrade, who walked across the room, knelt down, raised one of the rear wood heathstones, and took out a bag that jingled presently. He subtracted from it twenty or thirty dollars for himself, as much as Indian Joe, passed the bag to the latter, was on his knee in the corner now, dragging, digging with his bowie knife. The boys forgot all their fears, all their mysteries and incidents, gloating eyes. They watched every moment, luck. The splendor of it was beyond all imagination. Six hundred dollars was money enough to make half a dozen boys rich. Here was treasure, hunting, under the magnificent aspects. There would be not any burdensome uncertainty as to where to dig. They nudged each other every other moment. Eloquent nudges, and easily understood, for they simply meant, Ah, oh, we ain't no, ain't you glad? Now we're here. Now Joe's knife struck some upon something. Hello, he said. What is it? said the comrade. Half right on plank. Now it's a box, I believe. Here, bear a, uh, bear a hand. We'll see what's in there. It's here for. Never mind. I broke a hole. Reach his hand in it. In and drew it out. Man, his money, the two men explained. Examined the handful of coins. The gold, the boys above, were sighted themselves and delight, as delighted. John's comrade said, We have made quick work of this. You mean, there's an old rusty pick over a bit amongst the weeds, the corner, the other side of the fireplace. Ah, so a minute ago, he ran, brought the pit boy's pick and shovel. Injun Joe took the pick, looked at it over it critically, shook his head muttered something to himself, and then began to use it. The box was soon unearthed. It was not very large. His iron bond had been very strong before the slow years had injured it. The men contemplated the treasure while well, of all in blissful silence. Ah, there's thousands of theirs here, said Indian Joe. Ah, it was always said that Marrow's gang used to be around here one summer. The stranger observed. I know it, said Indian Joe. And this looks like it. I should say, you, now you won't need to do that job. Harper and Franz said, said he, you don't know me. At least you don't know all about the that thing. Twist Robbie to go get her. He's a range of flaming light. Flick flamed his eyes. I'll need you to help with it. When it's finished, then Texas, go home to your nance and your kids. Stand by until you hear from me. Well, if you say so, what we do with this? Bury again? Yes, ravishing delight overheard. Overhead. No, by the great stellar no, I found distress overheard. Ah, oh, no, I nearly forgot. That pick was fresh earth on it. A boys was sick with terror in, in a moment. What business was a pick and shovel here? What business was fresh earth on them? Who brought them in here? And where were they? Are they gone? Have they, have they heard anyone? Have you heard anyone? Seen anyone? What, burying again, and leaving him to come, and see the ground disturbed? Not exactly, not exactly. We'll take it to the mountain. Why, of course. Might they have thought of that before? You mean number one? No, not number one. On the cross, the other place is dead. Too common. All right, it's nearly dark enough to start. Indian Joe got up and went out about the front of the room to the window, cautiously peeping out. Presently he said, Who would have brought those tools here? Do you reckon they can be upstairs? The boy's breath forsook them. Indian Joe put his hand on his knife, held it a moment, undecided, then turned towards the staircase. The boy is full of closet. But his strength was gone. The steps came creaking up the stairs. The intolerable distress of situation woke the stricken resolution of the lads. They were about to spring for the closet 
when there was a crash of rotten timbers in the down landing on the ground and amid the dead breeze of the rotten staircase. He gave himself up, cursing. His comrade said, Now, what's the use of all that? If you know anybody, they are there up there, let them stay there. Who cares? They want to jump down now and get into trouble? Who jicks? Be, be dark in 15 minutes. Then I let them follow us if they want to. I'm willing to, in my opinion. Whoever mows these things, if they had caught a sight of us and took us for ghosts or devils or something. I bet they're running yet. Joe grumbling a while. Then he agreed with his friend that the day, what they let was left ought to be accommodized in getting things ready for the leaving. Shortly afterward, they slipped out of the house in a deepening twilight and moved towards the river with a precious box. Tom and Huck rose up, weak but vastly relieved, and stared after them through the chinks behind the logs of the house. Follow, but they, not they, they were content to reach ground again without broken necks, take the down, tra- down wood track over the hill. They did not talk much. They were too much absorbed in hating themselves, hating the ill luck they made them take the spade and the pick there. But for that, in your Joe never as if suspected. He would have hidden the silver with the gold to wait there till his revenge was satisfied. They would have had the misfortune to find the money done up missing. Bitter, bitter luck. The tools were never brought there. It was all to keep a lookout for that Spaniard, when he should have come to town, buying out the chances to do his revengeful job. I follow him to number two, wherever that may be. Then the gossip he fought the curtain job. Revenge? What does he mean? What is it? If he means us, Huck. Oh, don't, said Huck, nearly fainting. They only talked it all over. As they entered town, they agreed to believe. You'd possibly mean somebody else. At least, you might at least mean nobody but Tom. Short since, only Tom had testified. Very, very small comfort it was to Tom to be alone in danger. Accompanied me. Could be a pineapple improvement, he thought.